IODSA members. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's so lovely to have you all here. Please pop us a message in the chat box to say hello. We've already got Sophia on, Bongega, Ayanda, Denise, Dawn, Dave. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so happy to have you all here today um, at another BB at nine. This morning, we are so excited to welcome uh, Teko Makualibi. Um, and uh, he's going to have a very exciting topic, topic for us today on finance. But before we um, introduce Teko formally, I'll just like to go through our house rules this morning. As you all know, we are always, you're also always welcome to put any comments in the chat box or give us, um, share some links with us or just chat during the talk in the chat box. Um, if you've got any questions, you can pop them in the Q&A box and you are more than welcome during the session to raise your hand. We will then enable your voice functionality, in which case you can just unmute yourself. Um, other than that, we can um, now welcome Teko. Um, Teko with his topic today, finance of the future, the financial blueprint in the boardroom. In this session, you will learn about the exponential acceleration of convergent technologies and how they are shaping the future of finance and how boards can navigate enterprise disruption and stay ahead of the curve. Teko, a digital transformation and analytics leader at Solar Growth, spearheads enterprise-wide digital transformations. He's the co-founder of Alchemy Inspiration, an expert in strategy, design innovation, and emerging tech with over 17 years of diverse industry experience. Passionate about shaping symbiotic digital futures for enterprises, he holds academic credentials, including an executive MBA from Henley Business School, an MPhil in future studies from the University of Stellenbosch, and qualifications in design thinking, innovation, data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence from MIT and Columbia Business School. This is a mouthful. Welcome, Teko. You are more than welcome to switch on your camera now. Thanks so much, and uh, good good morning to everyone. Thank you for good hosting morning. me. I'll see you all later. Over to you, Teko. Okay, I've learned um, and given instructions not to waste time, just to drop dive right into uh, into the presentation. So that's what I'm exactly going to do. Okay, let me just get my bearings right here. Okay, great. Right. So our, our dialogue today, it's it's really gonna gonna focus on understanding the exponential conversions and change that is happening. Um, we're also gonna look at the emerging, what I call the new digital world order, right? And we're lo gonna look at how algorithms are gonna play a very strategic and pivotal role in the boardroom. And then we're just gonna look at a new Magna Carta for the boardroom in terms of what must leaders uh, you know, do in response to the technological disruptions and the exponential change, the exponential convergence that are impacting and shaping um, the world of finance. So the reason why I put a dialogue uh, is because I really want it to be very engaging. Um, Yes, I am an expert, but I'm really here as a student as well. I want to facilitate a conversation around the topic. So I will need your inputs as well. Um, what I really want is for you not just to leave with a little bit of you know, answers. I want you to leave with questions, with uh, uh, curiosity. I want to spark your curiosity. Now, because I'm a futurist, uh, a practicing futurist, because I've been trained for more than seven years, um, you will find that most of my thinking is going to be a little bit more into the future state uh, versus into the now. You're going to find it's going to spark uh, creativity. It's going to spark imagination. So allow yourself to go there. You know, I know as leaders, we're always buckled down with with the now and 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 chasing our KPIs and and shareholder value and all that stuff. But for today, I just want you to push the envelope enough for you to just see what might be happening or coming um, at the curve. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I like 
thinking in, in, in pictures because I think it's easy to learn. I, I've, I had to learn that way. Um, and also I like using models and framework just to you know uh, frame and, and contain a conversation within a certain structure that can be followed. It doesn't mean that it's a perfect model, but at least it will it will spark uh, a conversation around it. So please feel free. Anytime you have a question, just, just throw it in the chat. I'm also going to ask um, the audience questions as well. So please feel free to just, to just jump in. Okay. Now, what's this that you are seeing in front of you? Really, it's, 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 it's a model that I have developed um, that allows us to understand exponential convergence and the change that is happening, right? And the conversations that that we should have around that. Now you will see that you are you you on your horizontal axis you have time, you have past, present, and the future. And on your vertical, um, you have the speed of change or the pace of change. Now you will see the two the two circles here, the two uh, little bubbles here. So the first one that you see it's really the one that's in the present or in the in the present and the old world. Um, and then the other one that you see, it's it's more looking at the future world or the emerging world and what is happening. And you will see that in, in the old world, right? If you follow the the, the red the red um line there or the red curve, you will see that it was more linear, right? And our ability to adapt, to change, um, was superseding the change itself when you look at the, the green line. So we, we had the, the ability to adapt. Um, our neuroplastic, neuroplastic um, you know, brain simulation could adapt to the change because there wasn't really that much change um, that was happening in the old world. Everything was linear, everything was sequential, everything you could, there was certainty, you could predict what's going to happen because there wasn't enough uh, convergence and the speed of change wasn't really that exponential. But then as you begin to move into the future and as, as technology, especially, and the way we adopt these technologies um, started getting faster and more powerful and we started adopting them. What, what, what started happening? They started disrupting, they, they started changing uh, systems. They started changing structures that we have in place. But then there's something that started happening in our neurological brain makeup because the change started to accelerate. Our ability to adapt was now compromised. We started to be less um, agile. We started to be less uh, anti-fragile because we were used to, you know, a state in the past and in the present where really change was linear. We could we could understand it. We could predict it with almost certainty. And the future in the past was very predictable. But now as these technologies and industries started converging, all of a sudden the future becomes blurry. And it's very hard now to even plan or even have like a five year or a 10 year strategy, right? Because it's so foggy, there's so much change happening that disruption is happening in seconds. Even now while having this dialogue, disruption is happening around this topic. Maybe even some of the things I'm going to share with you are actually in the nanosecond past because of the changes that are constantly happening. So our ability to adapt to change started diminishing. Now, remember, as a species, the reason why we are the masters of, of creation, if, if I may say it like that, or we have mastered the animal, right, is because we have the power and the ability to adapt because that's how our brain is wired. Right. While inferior or lower creatures or creations, they really do not have that ability. Right. Even though nature itself is coded to adapt, but it's coded to adapt within a certain perimeter and structure. If I were to bring in, you know, algorithms and AI, we would have that discussion around that. So as the change started increasing exponentially, right, what started happening was disruption started happening. And really it's it's a state of a future shock because disruption is really not understanding how to respond to something that is in the unfamiliar way of doing things, way of thinking, 
way of organizing, way of working, and, and way of you know, doing finance and financial systems that we are aware of. So in the, in the new world or the future world, it is full of future shocks. And this changes so many things. This changes the rules of the new world are no longer even the same as the rules of the past or the old world. And we find ourselves in this constant um, tumultuous, you know, portal, if I may say, of secular future shocks that are happening faster and faster and faster. And if you look at the pace of technology right now, I mean, look at uh, generative AI, you know, um, it, it's exponentially moving. Why? Because we have opened it up to the public and we are innovating around it. But not only that, in the past, these technologies were standalone technologies. So you would have, um, let's say, technology A, technology B, technology C. They were standalone technologies. They were not really um, connected. But now what's beginning to happen, we find technology beginning to become a connected, intelligent um, system in itself. Why? Because the bandwidth, is increasing, computing power um, is increasing, right? And the speed is increasing. The storage is also increasing. We can put so many uh, chips within one component that can interact um, with other technologies. And we have this cognitive, intelligent, technological sphere that is driving the change. And funny enough, it is, it is said that in the next 10 years, technology will be 100 times faster and more powerful, not just faster, but also more powerful, meaning it will connect and it will do computations faster and more powerful. So the question is, as leaders, how are we gonna lead in that world that is being eaten up line by line, code by code, by algorithms, by AI systems, by software? It's as if we are in the first nanoseconds of the internet waking up and deciding what to do and deciding to rearrange our economy. Look at what happened during the pandemic. Our ability to adapt was highly compromised because our systems were fragile, right? Our systems were fragile. Our health system, the infrastructure, the water infrastructure, the supply chain, the food infrastructure, even our financial systems, they were fragile. They were not built to take on a future shock. Right. So now we're moving into uh, a state where we need to be anti-fragile. We need to be able to take these future shocks, these impacts of the future or of the emerging future so that we can become agile and flexible and be able to adapt to change. Now, as we move from this linear dimension of change into the disruptive dimension of change, we find that we're now tapping into the exponential. And I don't even think we are in that exponential yet. It's still a space between the present and the future. We, ha we are not even there yet. The moment we start hitting exponential shift and exponential you know, uh, uh, disruption or even beyond disruption, then what we're gonna see is a complete um, reinvention of our cyber physical system. Why? Because technology, is organizing itself into a collective intelligence, shaping and reinventing our world into a cyber physical kind. And that's the, the convergence of synthetic reality and real reality. And we need to find ourselves within that space. Um, we have you know, experiments that are already proving uh, to succeed in the marketplace um, or in the labs for now, like uh, Neuralink, which is really just you know, uh, putting a microchip in your brain and you can interface with technology. Like your Alexa can interface with you right now and with the internet ecosystem, right? And then also what we're seeing is change is not just happening exponentially, but it's also happening synchronously, which means that it is not happening in sequence. It is happening in a way that it's not chronological. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we know it's going to happen. And as leaders, how do we manage change that moves beyond exponential to change that is now unsynchronous, to change that is now 
um, not in sequence and not in time. We don't know when it's going to happen. It's like knowing an earthquake is going to happen, but you don't know when and where and how it's going to impact. And really what we need is real-time insights and data. So think, for instance, in, in the financial landscape. How are we going to navigate that, right? How are we going to use technology to help us lead and drive um, our organizations into this type of future? Not only that, we are seeing industry sector barriers um, becoming permeable and dematerialized by this convergence. And what happens is that it's making even regulation to be hard and it's increasing the level of risk within the ecosystem. So industries are no longer standalone. You no longer have the telcos and then you have um, the health industry or any, something like that or the banking industry. Everything is converging into an ecosystem because technology in itself is very rebellious. But remember now, who designed these technologies? Who designed these platforms? We did, and, and we are like that in our nature. We love change, right? We, we have survived as a human species because we have continuously changed and we are continuously changing. And then also the other thing is organizations are becoming more decentralized and, and, and autonomous. You know, think of remote work. That's decentralization of leadership. How are you gonna lead you know, uh, a workforce that is borderless, that is anywhere in the world, people that you have never been met before, but still have the levels of productivity that you want. And also organizations are becoming more autonomous and work is moving more into a, a personalization framework versus a collective framework. And then I did touch on risk, that risk has never been high like, like it is before. And regulation is more co complex because of the emerging uh, ecosystem, where standalone sectors and industries, the, the barriers are breaking and um, there's a more holistic um, ecosystem. And then also we are seeing quite a lot of things. I mean, the emergence of, new of a new financial order, for instance, decentralized finance. And this is where blockchain um, technology is, is having a huge impact, moving financial systems and the financial infrastructure from a centralized paradigm and shifting it to a decentralized paradigm shift. And that has implication. How does that affect our asset classes? Where should we invest? How, how is value gonna be stored? How is currency gonna be created and flow through the financial system, right? But these systems, like I'm saying, that's still so, so fragile. You know, that's why everyone, you know, quite, quite a lot of people are saying, hey, Take it easy on this uh, cryptocurrency thing. But I mean, things are moving towards that direction if you think about it. But now change is happening even at a macro level, not just you know at a, at a micro level, industry specific or ecosystem specific, it's happening at a micro level. And we're seeing, you know, uh, if you just look at me a mega challenge right now, um, economy, which one do we prioritize? Do we prioritize economy? Do we prioritize climate? These are all financial um, implications with the change that is happening. Energy, carbon to clean, they're all having financial Im implications. Um, profit and growth, having implications on policy. Do we move more towards a framework of people, planet, purpose, and prosperity? Or are we just looking at just profit and growth for the sake of profit and growth. So you find that even the social consciousness is changing. The social consciousness of humanity is changing. And these shifts are, are happening because of the technologies uh, that we have, but also because of the adoption of these technologies. The private sector, the economic force, moving more towards a public sector, you can even say it's probably changing uh, 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 the ideology in which our economy rests on, right? Capitalism is as, as, as well, from shareholder to stakeholder, and the list goes on and on. So we find uh, a parallel future beginning to open up. And that is very important because as leaders, how are we going to lead within an emerging parallel or polar future? Okay, so let me let me just engage you as the audience. Um, 
and you can jump in. You can either go into the chat or you can just voice out. As leaders, how have you positioned your organization to navigate disruption? What changes are you preparing for? Just anyone. Just going to open the chat. Anyone? I'll just wait for a few seconds in case the chats are still black, blackout scenarios. Yeah. Yeah. Blackout scenarios. Okay. Coalition government. All these have implications, right? Mm hmm. Let's bring more. All encompassing disaster recovery. Okay. No coal power alternatives. Yeah. I can see that uh, probably probably the person is in the is in the energy sector. Um, just crumbling infrastructure alternatives. Move into on organic. So these are all the, the polarities. Understanding. Digital transformation, you know, which of which right now it, it feels like it's a Frankenstein topic. Each one is doing it and doing it, you know, differently. Cybersecurity threats, yeah. Digital ransom, uh, educating customers to adapt to technological changes. Um, okay, okay. But maybe customers should be the ones educating us to adapt to the technological changes so that we can remain customer centric. But that's powerful. Okay, any more? Okay, thank you for thank you for the comments and for the engagement. Okay, there's one last more. Uh, a change in the world of work. I think we are only starting to see how work will change and how employees will be working. Uh, in the future. And, and the key word there, it's not going to be where it's, it, it goes actually beyond working is, is how we create value um, in the future. I think it's, it's going to be more, you know, uh, purpose driven versus I need to work so that I can make money. Uh, we've just experienced BRICS and more countries wanting to join. Yeah. It's changing um, the geopolitical financial arrangement, especially looking at, you know, that the power of the dollar as well as a um, reserve currency. What impacts are these going to have on our investments offshore? So those are the type of things that human intelligence not being competent against against AI, even though a lot of people will argue that, but I understand exactly what you're saying because of computational power. Our neuroplasticity is, is it, to make for our brains to make connections of new ideas and thoughts. It takes quite a lot of time. Um, artificial intelligence, AI as part of industry, a mafia state, wow. Pakanati, wow, okay, a mafia state. All right, okay, <laughs> great. Okay, that's, uh, that's very uh, great to get those comments. Uh, so let me go back to, to where we, we need to be. Okay, so when we talk about digital, digital, the digital future, digital emergence, what are, what are we really um, talking about? So now I want you to, to use your imagination. So allow this, this lie to exist, please, okay? So I'm just using the imagination while looking at a new digital world order, which is different from internet 2.0, which is different from internet 1.0, while looking at a very powerful thing that is happening within the digital space. Look at how real digital has become, even just in the way we do work. Look at how real digital has become in the Gen Zs and the Gen Alphas. You know, I, I talk to my son and I say to him, why don't you just go outside and, and visit visit your neighbors it's like no i'm like why not because i'm already here on 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 uh on these immersive metaverse platforms like roblox and uh all these other ones that are there i'm already there talking and having fun with them and more than that i'm having fun with 
people that I have not even met in China, in the US, in Philadelphia, in wherever, in Brazil. And these are people that I know. So their experience of what we would call disruption for them is, is easy. It's just immersive play. So you wonder if these Gen Zs and gen generation alphas are already so cybernetically connected with synthetic reality. In the future, in what type of organizations do you think, because they're going to be future leaders, right? What type of organizations do you think they're going to lead, they're going to create, and they're going to invest in? And are you already preparing for that type of uh, reality? So in the new digital world order, to just demystify it and to bring an understanding. Imagine how we felt as, as an innovative species called humans um, when we first encountered you know, electricity or the steam engine or the assembly line. It was, it was a eureka you know, moment. So what's the eureka moment right now? AI is the new electricity. And what did we do when we encountered electricity? We just had to learn how to harness it, right? But now in the new digital world order, it's very hard, even though we can harness it, but remember now they are growing and, and the speed of change is so exponential. And then data in the new digital world order is, is the new oil, cloud is the new enterprise engine, um, algorithms are the new state, XR, extended reality, internet of things are the new digital senses. Um, digital analytics are the new genome for synthetic AI. The metaverse is the new earth, it's the new sand pit that we play in. Um, blockchain is the new store of trust. Trust has been dematerialized. 2008 financial collapse. Bitcoin was born. Why? Because trust was dematerialized. Uh, governance was corrupted in Wall Street and in so many other places. And that's really why we call it born, really. And then avatars are the new digital citizens. And if you if you get into your, your child's world at the game and you realize that the avatars now, because with these games like Fortnite, they buy, you know, what they call skins and guns and all that stuff. And you buy them with with real money. You buy tokens with real money and you have this tokenized economy. And what's going to happen is that you can now actually even sell your avatar at a at, you know highest bidder. And you find that the avatars are having more um they're having more currency than the physical persons. Now, this is the type of reality that our children, for those who have kids on the platform, are actually moving into and are already playing in where your avatar is actually more important than your biological self. And then we're seeing the emergence and the explosion of Web 3.0, which is the new internet of value and marketplace. You can now create um, and store value on the internet and be able to transact that. All of this is really on the found is happening on the foundation of an internet native financial system, a decentralized economy, and a new financial architecture. And if you think of the banking industry, I mean, look at look at the tech of the banking banking industry. It's based on 1960s infrastructure. That is why it is so fragile, right? That is why. There's a quite a lot of gaps when it comes to cybersecurity, for instance. So let me throw another question to the audience. What do you think are some of the challenges in leading in the emerging digital future? I'm just going to open the chat. I will not take too long on this one. What do you think are some of the challenges? in leading in the emerging new world order, digital new world order. Yeah, adapting 100%, regulation 100%. You see, everything is, is speaking to that model that we talked about. Um, cybersecurity 100%, the ability to be visionary and agile. 
um, skill shortage. Yeah, yeah. And but we can augment that with uh, artificial intelligence and robotics, embracing dynamic change, realize mission of the business, lack of agility and flexibility, hackers, change management. <laughs> I would rather I would rather change that because how do you manage change that you do not understand? I would rather call it adaptability management, <laughs> policy changes and change. Okay, monetizing these new digital innovations. Yeah, we have to think around that. Like, how do we do it? I like this one: ethics, ethics with biosynthetic um, nanotechnology. We can actually hack the the human genome and change it and the ethics of our very essence can be hacked and is in jeopardy of being hacked. So we need ethics around some of these things. Imagine uh, how are your children, for instance, gonna compete with um, other, other kids, you know, that have been genetically modified. That's a big one, right? And it's gonna change the essence of the DNA. It's gonna augment that gen genomic uh, capabilities with extra um, capabilities. Okay, human values, yes, human values is a big one. Okay, let me move to the next slide. And then from there, we will just end. Now, as boards, what are the, the key areas that we, we need to look into in this, new digital world order that is emerging. What are the key areas? One, we need speed. We need more objectivity. We need to be able to, to, to foresee and manage risk and mitigate against rich risk. We need to simulate uh, for strategy. Our strategy has to be open strategy, adaptive strategy. So now what we're going to see happening, there's going to be a new board member in the board and it's going to be an algorithm it's going to be an intelligent um ai it doesn't even have to be super ai some are saying we're already going into agi because of what chat gtp is doing or generative ai and really generative ai is wiring the brain of ai with deep neural networks what we're, we're teaching ai how to think better and faster um than us but now there's, a, there's another black box where it is sort of like uh, waking up, some say, to its own sentient awareness on consciousness. Um, we have seen uh, quite a lot of tech leaders who have been leading in that space, even leaving some of the tech companies say, hey, I need to be a whistleblower for humanity. Um, but yeah, that's like black ops of algorithms and AI. No one is really sure what is happening there. So I don't even want to open that Pandora's box. But how can algorithms help us when it comes to speed? Because we need the ability to make decisions fast because change is very fast. And what algorithms can do, they can quickly process large volumes of structured and unstructured data. And most of the time we're dealing with unstructured data. We do not understand what we do not understand, but that in itself is data, right? That in itself is data. Um, and these algorithms can help us um, enable you know, faster decision-making and give us more agility. The other part is objectivity, right? Algorithms can provide objective assessments when it comes to offshoring, offshore investments, mergers, acquisitions, um, by analyzing various factors automatically. It doesn't mean that it's gonna take decision-making power for us, but we are augmenting our decision-making capability, at least right at the edge of the, the change curve that is leading into an unforeseeable um, future, right? And algorithms, remember, they're not biased, even though there's a certain level of bias because they were created by human. But the more we train these models through machine learning, they will start adapting and making, you know, their own conclusions and their own scenarios. And that's where now we go into deep neural networks. That's an exciting uh, landscape there. And then also they can enable us to manage the risk. They can monitor and analyze market trends, uh, regulatory changes, um, compliance standards, right? Ensuring that the board 
stays ahead of potential risk. My favorite one, they can simulate uh, for strategy and, and we can really leverage, you know, to model different scenarios and make strategic decisions with real-time data. Right now we make decisions with data that is old, with data that is still unstructured. We still have to structure it, synthesize, analyze, and then from there we have insight. That's, that, that is taking too long. But with these algorithms in the module, we can be able to do that in real time, in seconds. And then also with the simulation, we can identify and assess potential risks and vulnerabilities in real time, assist in financial planning, forecasting by model different financial uh, scenarios. And this is already being used in some of these investment uh, uh, houses. And then real-time simulations can help to understand the potential consequences of different actions and make quick and effective decisions during critical moments. Now, what should we do as leaders? What is the new Magna Carta uh, for the board? One, we need to understand the landscape of emerging technologies and their business impact. And then number two, we need to examine and explore potential transformative um, technologies and strategize how to benefit from these technologies and separate hype from real business value. Also, we need to adopt an AI strategy and integrate AI into the body. Lastly, we need to mitigate risks and uh, prioritize cybersecurity. All right, I will open the floor for uh, a Q&A question and answer. Thanks so much for, for your engagement thus far. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, Teko, we've got a couple here. Okay. The first one is, do you think social media will overtake domain names? Social media, I think, yes, look, I think in Web 3.0, uh, we're definitely going to see that happening. Um, we're already seeing metaverse marketplaces. We are already seeing, and Web 3.0, it's, it's an internet that allows social interactions. But beyond social inter interactions, they allow value to be exchanged between those interactions. And we're already seeing this in, you know, companies already buying land on the metaverse, uh, Medbank, uh, MTN, for instance. Um, and I have a piece of land as well on the metaverse. I'm, I'm just waiting for, for um, avatar traffic so I can put a billboard there and it's making money for me. <laughs> Because then you were talking about the algorithms and giving examples of those. But as we know, we, we spoke about adapt, you know, adapting to these changes and algor algorithms. How do we get the board and people to buy into using these algorithms and resources available to help us with getting through these changes? Yeah, I think, I think really to answer this question effectively, we need to understand the times we're in. It's, it's almost, you know, choice is limited. Choice has been taken away from us, right? We need to understand the change that we're in. We need to understand the exponential forces. And then we need to understand that these intelligent systems are just tools, just like we use electricity, just like we use the steam engine, just like we used um, the assembly line. They are just tools. But obviously in using them, that demanding us to adapt and also to reinvent certain things. So I guess it's it's just really understanding the times in which we are in. And we're almost saying there's no choice. AI is coming for every organization. AI is coming for every body. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in an earlier discussion, um, Valentini asked a question in the chat box. Um, yeah. when you were talking about, um, well, we were widening, how do we widen the in inequality? You know, how do we include rural people into the fold of these changes? Yeah, I, I will leave that to, um, 
to the telecommunications regulatory board and the telco companies to, to answer that question. But I mean, look, there's there's still quite a lot of regulation that is protected um, by the system, uh, for the system. But we do know that technology in its nature is very disruptive. Um, look at what, and I, and I hate saying this, but yeah, we can't get around it. Look at what Elon Musk is doing with, with Starlink, for instance, just beaming internet, you know, from, from space versus, you know, spectrum and all that stuff. So technology will democratize um, equality, but it demands us to adapt it. It demands us to shift towards a greed-based economy to a more inclusive and holistic-based human economy. Uh, Teko, there's a question from Peter Beside Notes. He's asking, can you further comment on how you see the metaverse impacting on boardroom thinking and determination of strategy? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, right now at uh, the company, at Solid Growth, the company that I work for, um, we are building, we're actually building a metaverse platform. We're in the process of testing that. And basically what we're doing, we're gamifying the employee experience because most of the time we work remotely and also we are borderless, we are global. We have teams in Egypt, we have teams in the US, we have teams in the in the UK. How do we now use some a technology like the metaverse to ignite creativity, to ignite innovation and collaboration? But at the same time, that's just a human layer of gamifying the employee experience. At the same time, we can tokenize that and be able to monetize it. So nice. Um, then a question from Nanda Gavinder. Which board committee should be mandated with focusing on AI and algorithm strategy and oversight? What skills are required in the boardroom? Yeah, I think I think in the boardroom, you see. I think in the boardroom, we're lacking two roles. One, a futurist, someone who can help us in understanding the changes that are happening, not just on a technological landscape, but on a human consciousness, right? So we need that role to be there. And then the other one, we need an AI expert. That's, those are the two roles that we need. And then also ethics but that we already have. Yeah. Yeah, that's very important. A uh, question here from Kubus. The metaverse, can we talk how we merge the activities and products in real tangible world to the metaverse? What products or markets exist in the metaverse versus products that exist in the tangi tangible world? Wow. Remember, the metaverse really is about how do we simulate the physical world into the virtual world. So it, it functions really like you would want it want to function in the physical world. And the APIs that you can use, uh, there's a blockchain technology that you can use to integrate some of these, you know, uh, digital values and digital value assets. And these are uh, intangible assets within the metaverse. And then whatever happens on the metaverse, because technology is coming a cyber physical conversions and reality, you can be able to trigger certain actions, you know, in the real world, but you trigger them in the metaverse, but you experience them in the real world. Thanks, Deco. Um, Dudu Msomni is asking, is leadership training and education equipping leaders for this exponential world? She's basically asking, who trains the trainer? <laughs> well, who trains the trainer is Curiosity. That's really who trains the trainer. Um, curiosity. And uh, yeah, I think business schools especially have that, should literally carry that mandate of disrupting the traditional way of learning and introducing some of these uh, new ways of thinking and new skills. And it's been said that creativity is actually going to be the number one skill that is needed because we're going to need creativity in order to interface and, and also interact and also innovate with and around um, these exponential technologies. 
Thanks, Deco. Um, another question, what role do you see technology playing in the future of finance? Oh, wow. Um, look, I think technology will really play an intelligent interface role between the board, for instance, and exponential and the exponential changes that are happening, um, both at a more macro and also at a micro level for insights and intelligent decision making. And then when you look at technologies like quantum and cloud computing and AI simulators, which I talked about, they will really start bridging you know, the gap between the present and the future, because what we need is foresight. We need high insight and also we need foresight. And what's gonna happen is that it's gonna make finance more forward looking um, and autonomous versus you know, being transactional. Thank you. And another question just popped through. Let me read through it. Derek Kunaka is asking, profit making, value creation and cost saving are often the promise of digital transformation. Do you have examples of quantified cost savings or increases in profits that have been realized by employing AI in businesses, for example, or is it just a hype for now? Good question. It's not a hype. It's 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 really um, a real tangible um, appreciation of of your assets, whichever one. I think it's only hype if digital transformation is not uh, deployed or it's not driven in a holistic, integrated way across the organization. Um, just think of right now what intelligent bots can do when it comes to aut automation, some of your transactional. Um, processes, right? Even just having a spreadsheet, instead of just filling in a spreadsheet and you're typing, you know, your life and your fingertips away, you can just use an OCR technology, take a snapshot, and it populates it by itself. So this is where you can get some of these cost savings and uh, appreciation of digital value into, into real value. Thank you, Teko. Uh, Kubis is asking, it was reported on the new that Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse lost 21 billion on, on uh, Re Reality Labs in roughly 18 months in July 2023. Is the metaverse a real way forward for the rest of us? Or is it just more a hype with no clear strategies? Yeah, look, I think, I, I think it's really still in that trough of disillusionment when you look at the, the Gartner hype model or hype cycle, it's probably still there, but real world use, uh, you know, use cases are beginning to emerge and there's real money and transaction, transactions happening on the metaverse. But I mean, everything that starts, it's, it's always a hype up until it hits mainstream and there's a massive adoption of the technology. And the question is, as, as a leader or as, as board, do we just look at them as hype and say, look, we'll start running while everyone has already run? Are you always going to be lagging behind the speed of change or are you going to lead and drive change? And there's a lot of investment now. Look at what SoftBank is doing. There's quite a lot of invest, investment into future-centric um, and focused you know, companies. And they know they're going to lose money. But guess what? They are shaping. They are shaping the future, the future yeah. that you will catch up to. Yeah, yeah. Someone needs to do that, right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, McCarty. McCarty is also adding to this. Says, do you have any examples of how this metaverse has added real value? She's struggling to come across these, except for gamification and simulation. Okay. Um, buying land, for instance, uh, on on the metaverse has added value, right? Um, there's a company called uh, Upland. There's a company called uh, Africa Rare, and they're selling land on the metaverse. And Africa Rare, is, it's, it's a South African, you know, made, uh, man-made company um, by one of the chapter founders of Singularity University. Um, also, we're seeing, obviously, creative arts um, being sold on the metaverse and NFT tokens and all that. So these things are still in the early stage of 
really adding new value, but we already see the potential of that value. Guys, we still have about five minutes for questions, so please pop your questions in um, while we're waiting for your last questions. I'm just going to ask Dick or something from my side. Um, you mentioned uh, your children um, also yeah. you know, in gaming and playing with avatars and how important it is to them. Um, I've noticed the same with my kids. And, um, you know, there's so many articles in magazines um, and online about, you know, warning parents of allowing your kids to play games and yeah. be online too long. So how do we how do we deal with this as, as parents? You know, how where do yeah. we find a balance? Look, as much as I am a technologist, a futurist technologist, and I'm pro-technology, but at the same time, I'm also pro-human. And it is true. They do have a psychological um, impact, right? And um, look, I think it's, it's really how you want to raise your children, <laughs> you know. Um, you can deploy screen time and, and be able to um, to lock that gadgets at a certain time and they won't be able to access screen, you know, the, the, those technologies. Um, and it has been shown that it, it's actually um, rewiring the human cognitive, you know, brain. And it's actually even also impacting the attention span. So we have to look at into these uh, type of things and see how do we psychologically uh, manage them? Because at the end of the day, as much as technology is integrating with us and we are integrating with the technology, we are still human and, and we have to still protect that. And I think there should be ethics around it. I saw, um, I think it was, yeah, they were talking about it on CNN uh, in China, where China is now gonna make a rule that you can only access your phone as children, your phone, TV or video games, only for a certain period of time in the week, depending on how old you are. So yes, we need to we need to understand the human brain and the psychology, and and how technology impacts it, and then also embed ethics uh, in that as well. Oh yeah, of course. And last comment I see from Bongeta: um, Adobe has already started putting OCR into PDF yeah. to extract text from snapshots. Quite yeah, true, true. True. I mean, what we do at Solid Growth, we actually automate um, your whole financial, your whole finance uh, function through various technologies that we use so that you instead of focusing on transactional financial operations, you can more focus on strategic uh, way of doing finance and interpreting finance. Thanks, Deco. It seems like um, we've come to the end of our session. I'm going to share um, our QR code. Thanks so much. With you guys. Um, thank you so much, Deco. It was um, really a very insightful session and um, given us so much insight on how to prepare ourselves for the technology um, era that we are in and that we are moving into. Um, on the screen, you'll see Deco's uh, information here if you would like to get involved and um, would like to contact him at you know, um, at any time. Also, Solly Growth, thank you so much for, for bringing Teco on board. And then um, please uh, scan this QR code to give us feedback on today's session. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, this session will also be available afterwards. We, would e we will email this to you um, in an email afterwards. And then, yes, I will then close today's session. Have a wonderful Wednesday. Thank you again, Teco. Thanks so much. Thank you. Go well, everyone.